12 presents The East End with Doug B. You see them all throughout the East End, quaint country churches that in some cases go back hundreds of years, yet still have very vibrant congregations today. Hello again, I'm Doug Geed. Welcome to a very special edition of our East End Show. In the next half hour, we're going to show you some of the churches and synagogues that help give this area its unique charm, that help make it so beautiful. We begin our journey through history on the South Fork. That's one thing about towns. They're very prideful of their churches. And certainly Southampton, East Hampton, whatever, you get this incredible pride because the very first settlers, the first white settlers, after all, mostly were tied into one religion. And it was very important to get that first meeting house up. And then as the town grew, they wanted bigger meeting house, better meeting house. So we went through about probably five Presbyterian meeting houses until you get to the, the present one. Here, the Catholic Church is a symbol of the summer colony. It's probably one of the most beautiful churches on the East End. And it was constructed with a lot of help from the summer colony because they had hired a lot of the Irish people. They brought a lot of the Irish maids and butlers out here. So a lot of the families who were in reality probably good Episcopalians, gave money for some of the beautiful windows in this church. And this church is just so fine, so detailed, and you can tell the congregation adores it. I think what they wanted to do is to give it both an antique look, plus the sense that we've just built this magnificent marble palace for God. So you get the contrast of what we call rusticated, which is this sort of rough, almost Greek-looking marble, then the smooth, uh, marble, and I think it's really very beautiful. Beautiful in a different way is the Dune Church, as they call it. Dune That's Church is extraordinary because, of course, it wasn't built as a church at all. It was, in fact, a life-saving station, one of, you know, many that were every five miles on the beaches to protect any ship that, you know, went aground. And so when the summer colony, who were mostly New York um, Episcopalians, needed a church after all, so they decided to build their own church. And it just happened that Mr. Betts, who had bought that land down there, who was a New Yorker, decided to, you know, what do I do with this old uh, life-saving station? It's not in use any longer, it's been abandoned. So he proposed that it be turned into a meeting house, turned into the church. And very quickly, uh, it started to get add-ons. Lewis Comfort Tiffany was hired to do some great windows down there. And the whole ambiance is great. And as you know, there's no furnace in that building. It's not air conditioned. And there isn't any real minister for the church, as you probably know as well. Every Sunday, a minister from any denomination from all over the world, people from Kenya, uh, you know, priests from New York City, uh, someone from, you know, the local synagogue. It's a very, very interesting summer tradition. A lot of the shingle-style churches were originally not year-round churches, so they tended to be a little less expensive, they didn't have to be insulated, and I think they followed a sort of English shingle-style tradition. The Stone Episcopal Church in East Hampton is really copying a little Sussex English church, and the artists who came out here in the 1880s thought that this area looked like England, looked like the north of England. Let's talk about Hampton Bays, the church right on Main Street, uh, another yeah. eye-catching Yeah, which is church. another example of Gothic revival. You know, you've got your two major religious styles that the Catholics, the Episcopalians, and the uh, any Protestant group chose, and it was either Romanesque with rounded arches, as you get in East Hampton, the Presbyterian Church, or the po pointed arches. And, you know, because to them, those were the designs of the great cathedrals of Europe, so obviously that's what you'd build your church. The Presbyterian Church in Bridgehampton, I guess they always knew the village wouldn't be big enough to have more than one, so they didn't say first or second or third, uh, as is often the case. It's been a worshiping congregation. They've been together since uh, 1670. Uh, originally, everybody in this area, uh, which at the time was called Bull's Head, and it was uh, 
people from here would walk down the beach every Sunday morning and go join Southampton uh, Presbyterian Church for their worship services. And I guess they got big enough that they decided, well, we're tired of walking that six miles down the beach. So they uh, built their own church in uh, 1670. I guess, what, 30 years uh, was enough of that for them. It looks like one of those white Puritan kind of New England churches. I've been told by architects uh, that it would probably be classified as a, a Greek Revival style of architecture. Um, it's got the big steeple and we have our clock on there. Uh, we have our uh, columns out front. Uh, we have our wonderful lawn, which is a real, um, a real drawing point, I guess. Lots of people like to just stand and kind of look at the vista. Uh, it looks very dramatic with the big long expanse of green and then the stone walk coming up to the church. So it's very classic. It is a little intimidating sometimes to look on our signs that we have out here in the front that uh, the first minister was back in 1695, Ebenezer White. And uh, his relatives are still very active and good members of the church. And uh, one of his relatives is now the organist. So they're still <laughs> very active in the church. Uh, but it's nice to be a part of that history. I'm the, only the 17th, I think, pastor that has served this congregation since 1695. So, uh, you know, the average stays here. People would stay 40, 50 years. As an architectural historian, um, when I take groups to Europe or if I go to Boston, we spend a lot of time in churches and sometimes, you know, there's a little balking until they get in them and see how personal every single one is. You can certainly see in a community the pridefulness, you know, where the church is located. You know, is it on the village green? Where is it located? Is it on a hill? You know, uh, what's it made out of? How is it taken care of? Certainly here, it was a statement uh, in stone and marble to create something that was very permanent, very striking. We have arrived. I mean, you know, there's, there's a power here. And churches were a powerful force all throughout the early days of the East End and even today. Up next in our special edition may be Long Island's oldest synagogue and a church from the whaling days of Sag Harbor that looks more Egyptian than early American. Stay with us here on the East End. The first congregational church standing proudly right in the heart of downtown Riverhead. Welcome back to a special edition of our East End Show in which we take a look at the houses of worship that help make this whole area so unique. Our next stop is the village of Sag Harbor, home to what's believed to be the oldest synagogue in New York State and also home to the Old Whalers Church. This church was built in 1844 when whaling was at its height and they thought the village would continue to grow. Unfortunately, about six years after they built this building, the bottom dropped out of the whaling business and the character of the village changed completely. And so this church has never been used to its capacity. And we estimate that if you filled every pew in the, on the main floor and in the balconies, we could fit about 900 people in here. This congregation was the first congregation that was started in uh, 1766. The first record we have of any land ownership in Sag Harbor was about 1706, and there may have been squatters here before that. So you can see it took 60 years to build a church, so this didn't start out as a particularly uh, religious community. I think it was sailors, smugglers, fishermen, and uh, squatters. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, their conscience got to them, I guess. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, once the, uh, they started making big money from the whaling industry, I guess they got religion. Because in the 1830s, there was a huge religious revival and necessitated the abandoning of the older church and building this much larger one. When they built this church, they wanted to build something special. So they hired probably the most foremost architect in the United States at the time. His name was Menard Lefevre. He's from New York City. They brought him out here. And he designed this church with a, a, an Egyptian revival facade. So the facade of the building resembles an Egyptian temple, a very unusual f type of architecture. Uh, Mr. Lefevre, I believe, thought that Egyptian revival would become a popular form of architecture, so similar to Greek revival. And apparently it didn't, so we have a very unique church here. Tell me about those moldings in the front. Well, along the roof line of the church, there are little squares. Uh, apparently an Egyptian building would have had cobra heads up there and Mr. Lefevre, being a, an experienced architect, realized that the Presbyterians of Sag Harbor were not going to go for cobra heads on their church. So he gave them something a little different. He gave them blubber spades. It's a representation of the tool that was used by the whalers to 
cut the blubber from the whale. In the 1830s and the 1840s, the whaling industry had grown to the point where ships from Sag Harbor and other East Coast ports, New Bedford, New London, Nantucket, were sailing right around the world. And the whaling ships coming back from a three-year voyage heading for home at Sag Harbor would come around Montauk Point. They'd, of course, be anxious to see the first sign of home. And the first thing they would see would be that huge white steeple towering above all the trees. So they all called it the Whaler's Church. Whether many of those sailors ever set foot inside a church, I don't know. But they all called it the Whaler's Church because it was their homecoming landmark. Hmm. And of course, that landmark, the, the steeple, has been gone for 60-something yes. years. Right? Well, the steeple lasted almost 100 years. And then, of course, um, you remember the 1938 hurricane came through Long Island. Uh, the wind got in that steeple, and it became airborne. The steeple actually lifted off the building and fell down, came down bottom first in the courtyard in front and fortunately tipped over towards the cemetery and away from the building and smashed to bits. So the building was scarcely damaged at all. How tall was the steeple, uh, Dave? Do you from know? the ground to the top was 185 feet. And the Montauk Point Lighthouse, well, you as told a me? comparison, the Montauk Point Lighthouse was 110 feet. And we still have high hopes of someday putting that steeple back. This whole community is very history-minded. Sag Harbor has a historic district that covers about three quarters of the village. And this building is probably the foremost building in town. So this one certainly has to be preserved. And when I come into this church, once we did a service here, and the theme was so great a cloud of witnesses, and I think that all the people that worshipped here from 1844 on are still with us in spirit. And you feel that when you're in here. An amazing story. Sag Harbor is a village filled with history and other beautiful churches. There's St. Andrews, started by what was a small Catholic population in the village in the early 1800s. Right across the street, Christ Episcopal, which was built in the late 1800s after the railroad to Sag Harbor was completed, bringing summer visitors to this picturesque harborfront village. And nearby is what's believed to be Long Island's first synagogue, Temple Adas Israel. When the uh, synagogue was first built, of course being an Orthodox synagogue, the uh, downstairs was where the men prayed and the women were up here on the balcony as the men and the women did not uh, mix during prayer services. Temple Adas Israel, the congregation goes back to 1883, uh, consisted initially of uh, a handful of uh, peddlers who used to come out from New York with their bag and baggage and 105 years ago they had gotten to the position where they could, uh, they could grow. And they bought this little tiny piece of land just about the size of this room that we're in right now. The beautiful altarpiece over there was carved by one of the charter members of the building. That goes back to uh, the 1880s. The windows are all done by a young lady of Russian descent, not Jewish, Romney Cromoris in the village. They all have a story behind them, uh, very, very interesting. There's the, uh, the eternal light. Uh, there's the dove that left on uh, came back from Noah's Ark to let them know there was land nearby. The most fascinating one is the one directly behind you, which uh, portrays the Holocaust. And it's a broken star of David and barbed wire, and yet in the distance there are stars, you know, the future is there. I started about 30 years ago doing a uh, interfaith uh, Thanksgiving service, and every Friday before Thanksgiving, our uh, altar here is graced with priests, nuns, ministers, of all different kinds, and it's a, it's a wonderful feeling, and the, the, the whole community comes to it. There is so much more to come in this special edition of our show. Next, the beautiful, quaint, white steepled churches of the North Fork. Stay with us here on the East End. Old fashioned, white steepled country churches, a pretty common sight out here in eastern Suffolk. Welcome back to the East End, a special edition of our show focusing on the houses of worship that help make this area so picturesque. A look now at the North Fork from here in Riverhead out to Orient. Southold was the most religious of all the uh, United in uh, New England colonies. The first thing they did, of course, was build a church. There was no separation of church and state here. Uh, they used the Bible as their law, Mosaic law. They were very, they were Puritans and not pilgrims. Uh, Puritans wanted to purify the Church of England and uh, that they came here. They didn't want anyone else in the church. This building is either the third or the fourth on this site. 
The church was organized in 1640, and this is an 18th century building. Here they chose the center of the community for their church. They had, uh, they had no competition. They could pick the best spot. They, they chose the best spot for the minister's home. This is the oldest cemetery in New York State. They started burying people here as soon as uh, the town was organized, the parish was organized in 1640. But the first gravestones, because these people were Puritans, they didn't believe in graven images, so they didn't have carved headstones. They had uh, markers made out of red uh, cedar, which only lasted about 100 years. So you can't find, uh, uh, really, our first settlers. They're here, but you can't find them. <laughs> Universalist church as you come into town and um, St. Patrick's, which was a mission church to the Irish, the uh, Congregational Church. I think it has the most startling and beautiful uh, windows. It's just great windows and uh, really unusual. I'm surprised that nobody's ever done research on how they came to be so lovely. Greenport has a very lovely Greek church that used to be a Presbyterian church very large Greek community here. That spot in Greenport, I guess by Main Street over there by the Towns and Manor Inn, you can stand that spot, I think you see what, three or four churches? Yes, right isn't that a beautiful sight? The, uh, I was reading a Dutch book published in 1655 and the author mentions that what the English did first was make towns and villages and uh, so the reference point was the church steeple, and you can see that all over South Old Town. You just, it's a mass of steeples. That is a lovely uh, picture in Greenport. Let's go west a little bit. Kachog, Matatuck, some gorgeous churches there as well. Yes, yes, Kachog has that was the second Presbyterian church after this one as the population expanded. That is a beautiful church. And uh, also they have a Methodist church and a little tiny Catholic church uh, near the school. The larger church in that parish is in Mattatuck. It's a very beautiful church built by the Norris family, and it's a Romanesque architecture. The original town plot here was only four square miles, so when they ended, South Hold ended up acquiring land and moving, as they had, you know, children, and the children had children, they ended up with 34. They went, South Hold went all the way to Wading River. This church was built in 1906, 1907. At that time, there was a great influx of people from Poland, and they would settle out here and work on the various farms. But I am told that in the beginnings, the people from the parish themselves went from home to home and collected 50 cents a week from the people to build this church. It's a Romanesque style uh, with uh, certainly rounded windows uh, and uh, the altar itself is, of course, not marble, though it may appear to be marble, but it's of wood, which is marbleized by paint. You actually do uh, some masses in Polish? I myself celebrate Mass every second Sunday in Polish. My associate ce celebrates the alternate Sunday. Can you say something for in, in Polish? Welcome us to your church or something that you might say during the service? Well, our po Polish, usual Polish uh, welcome is niech będzie pochwalony Jezus Christus, meaning praise be Jesus Christ. This is the typically Catholic Polish greeting. But of course, the one that's most popular with the people is Vitami. We welcome you. Are you proud? Very much. My time is drawing near to an end here. Uh, I'm due for retirement next year, but because of the centennial of the bishop extended it beyond that, um, and I just hope my health holds out so I can, can enjoy the centennial year of the parish. If it weren't for the churches, we wouldn't have our births records. We wouldn't have the cemeteries with the stones in them. We wouldn't have marriage records. I mean, sometimes we forget that the church really held together so much more than just the moral fiber. It held together the whole history of the community.
They stand for the dignity, hard work, uh, character of the people who lived here. You have to be, have an anchor of some kind. Uh, we can't just go on uh, uh, the hedonistic way of enjoying everything that goes on. We have to realize that there is a supreme being, otherwise this wouldn't be.